everyone. Welcome to the Ohio History Center's Virtual Learning Opportunities. My name is Hannah Brevoort. I am the Unit Manager for Museum Interpretation here at the History Center. And today I'm going to be bringing you a little bit of information about Victoria Woodhull. Now you may or may not be familiar with Victoria, but she was one of the most famous Americans of her day, which is the late 1800s. Uh, today she's probably best remembered as being a bit of presidential trivia because she was the first woman to run for president all the way back in 1872. But as we'll discuss today, running for president was actually just one of many accomplishments Victoria had in her lifetime. Now, before we get started talking about Victoria, it's important to have a little bit of context for the time in which she lived. When Victoria was born, it was at the height of the idea that the women's natural sphere was in the home. And this meant that for a lot of women, they were denied the freedoms of having a public life. Now, for some or all of Victoria's lifetime, some of the things that women couldn't do included, they could not go to a restaurant unless they were accompanied by a man. Uh, women could not uh, get their own wages if they were working. And actually in Ohio until 1861, a working woman's wages could be given directly to her husband with or without her consent. If a woman did happen to get divorced in this time period, custody of her children would default to her ex-husband. And of course, women could not vote yet. So when you look at this cultural context, Victoria's life and accomplishments are even more remarkable. So a little bit of background on Victoria Woodhull. She was born in 1838 to Roxy and Buck Claflin, seen here in this image, in the tiny town of Homer, Ohio, which around that time had a population of about 400 people. Today has around 1,000 people. Roxy, from what we know of her, was of German descent. She was likely illiterate. Buck was considered a sort of jack of all trades. He was always running different schemes, some of which we know got him into legal trouble. And so the family often moved around to avoid prosecution for various things he'd been accused of. Now, life at the Claflin's house was chaotic. Their neighbors remember that the children were running wild, the family was very poor, the children were often dirty, but that Victoria and her sisters were notoriously adorable children. They remember just how charming these Claflin children could be. And according to Victoria's own writings, she and her sister Tennessee at an early age began working as spiritual mediums. A little context on what a spiritual medium means. Spiritualism is a religion which still exists but was most popular in the decades after the Civil War and World War I and it began in 1848. Now the main beliefs in spiritualism were that the dead were not truly dead, that they still existed in some sort of spiritual form, and that they could pass on messages to the living. And the people who could pass on those messages were spiritual mediums. Now whether or not you believe in spiritualism or believe in spiritual mediumship, this was an incredibly powerful line of work. Mediums were mostly women, and they basically had free range to say whatever they wanted as long as they said that that message came from a spirit. So it's actually not uncommon for a spirit to advocate through a medium for women's suffrage, for temperance, all sorts of issues that were near and dear to women's hearts. And Victoria and her sister were so successful as spiritual mediums that they actually became their family's main income earners before they were each 10 years old. So there was a lot of pressure riding on Victoria. And from what we can tell, it was probably this pressure that made her seek out a new life for herself. And she did so in 1853 when she married a man named Dr. Canning Woodhull, who gives her her last name that we know her by. Uh, and she did this when she was only 15 years old. Now according to Victoria herself, this marriage, which produced two children, was not a happy one and she had divorced him by 1863 and taken up with a new partner, a Civil War veteran named Colonel James Blood. Now, Blood and Victoria had a long partnership, which we'll discuss parts of that next, uh, but the part of their lives that really puts Victoria onto the main stage of history begins in 1868 when Victoria, Colonel Blood, and her sister Tennessee move to New York. <laughs> 
While in New York, Victoria and Tennessee made their first of many firsts in their lifetimes when they opened the brokerage firm on Wall Street called Vic Woodhull, Claflin & Co. And this happened in January of 1870, so just two years after they moved to New York. They were the first women to ever work on Wall Street, let alone own their own brokerage firm. And the response from other brokers and the public was pretty varied. So many viewed them as a joke. Some people viewed them as a genuine threat, that they were a threat to gender norms, threat to Wall Street business as usual, but still others kind of treated them as a circus sideshow, lining up in the streets and gawking at them as their carriage rode past. And newspapers highlighted their good looks, the fact that they often dressed in matching outfits, and treated them really as a flashy novelty. And they gave them all sorts of nicknames in the, these articles, like the bewitching brokers or the queens of finance. And these articles, while talking about their good looks, rarely mention the fact that their firm was actually pretty successful. And it was successful because they drew on what was currently an underserved clientele, which was women. So the back room at, the, at their brokerage firm was actually reserved for female clients. So this is women who had a source of expendable income, women who had an inheritance, and they were able to stop by, visit with the sisters, and do financial business in a space that made them feel safe and respected and secure. And soon Victoria and Tennessee were making tens of thousands of dollars a year off of this. So you can imagine in the 1870s how much money that was. Was. and they were able to rent a mansion in a fashionable part of New York and they were able to launch their passion project in May of 1870 which was a newspaper called Woodhull and Claflin Weekly. Woodhull and Claflin Weekly gave Victoria a huge mouthpiece with which to espouse her views. And this newspaper was extremely radical. It was actually the first American newspaper to publish the Communist Manifesto in its entirety. And they often sided with labor unions. Now, the good thing about this newspaper from Victoria's perspective is that it gave her another way to announce herself to larger society and gave her the authority as a published newspaper owner to advance her career, and she chose to do so by getting involved in the suffrage movement. Now, when people talk about Victoria Woodhull, they often refer to her as a suffragist. This isn't actually accurate, though, because although Victoria often worked with suffrage organizations, gave lectures at suffrage meetings, she was never actually a member of a suffrage organization. And in fact, she often alienated prominent suffragists within the movement. And she did this through her views on things like marriage, monogamy, and love, as well as her tendency to advance her own political career over that of the idea of suffrage. When Victoria encountered the suffrage movement, it was actually at a bit of a crossroads. The larger nationwide movement had splintered into two main parties, one based in New England and one based in New York. Now, the main problem between the two was that the New Englanders felt that the New Yorkers were way too radical. The New Englanders were led by a woman named Lucy Stone, and the New Yorkers were led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And these two groups really butted heads. The New Englanders thought that the New Yorkers were looking too broadly at a host of other issues um, besides suffrage, and the New Englanders really felt that all of these groups should be focusing on just suffrage. So they were battling to be the voice of the movement, and the two groups wouldn't reunite until 1890. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony wrote extensively about how much they feared this infighting would completely derail the suffrage movement and really hoped that a younger voice from a younger generation would emerge to unite the two groups. In 1871, in January, it seemed like that savior had arrived because they received a news article from a newspaper called The Daily Patriot that talked about how one Victoria Woodhull was to testify in front of the Judiciary Committee of the Joint Houses of Congress, that's the National Congress in Washington, D.C., on the question of women's suffrage. So the question on their minds was, had their hero actually arrived? Victoria's 
talk in front of the Judiciary Committee, her testimony, was incredibly fascinating because she argued correctly that the Constitution never explicitly said male or men when talking about suffrage. It only used the word citizens. And that while states, according to the Constitution, had the right to regulate suffrage, they could not restrict or deny that right. As I said, those are factual arguments, but Congress didn't see it that way, and Victoria's testimony was ultimately not successful in getting Congress to reevaluate who could have the right to vote. But it's likely that Victoria was able to get what she really wanted out of this testimony. She got national news coverage, and she got attention from the suffrage movement, which was made up of mostly upper-class women. So for Victoria, who grew up poor in rural Ohio, suddenly she was entered into this upper-class world of women's suffrage, again, which is what she probably really wanted all along. And she was able to turn her increased fame into a career as a speaker, and she gave speeches all across the country through most of the 1870s. As if Victoria wasn't busy enough during this time, she also announced her presidency campaign in 1870 in her newspaper, The Weekly. But she didn't really begin campaigning in earnest until early 1872, when she announced that not only was she running for president, but she was doing so under the newly created Equal Rights Party, which she created herself. She also announced that Frederick Douglass, the famous anti-slavery activist, would be her running mate. Now, from what we can tell, Frederick Douglass never accepted, denied, or even acknowledged this nomination. So, while people can say that he was her running mate, the fact that he never accepted it means that they never really actually worked together on this. The election itself in 1872 is actually super interesting, even outside of Victoria's candidacy. She was up against the incumbent Ulysses S. Grant, an Ohio-born president, uh, who was running for the Republican Party, and then a newspaper editor named Horace Greeley, who is also from New York, who was running for the liberal Republicans. The Democratic Party didn't actually field a candidate in this election. They were so concerned about trying to defeat the incumbent Grant that they actually rallied behind the other Republican candidate, Greeley. Victoria was the only candidate in the presidential race who made women's suffrage a key plank of her platform, but her candidacy angered most of her remaining supporters within the women's rights movement. Susan B. Anthony wrote in a telegram to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, quote, I do not believe in any of us women, the majority of whom do not even own our bodies to say nothing of our purses, forming a political party. Do we see the farce? Susan B. Anthony felt incredibly betrayed by Victoria seemingly elevating her own political aspirations over the, for Susan B. Anthony, lifelong work of getting all women the right to vote. Now, if you do a little research on Victoria Woodhull, which I would encourage you to do, you may see that historians are conflicted about how serious her presidential bid was. A lot of them argue that this was really just a way for her to promote her newspaper, her brokerage firm, or even just herself and her speaking engagements, while others say that it's clear that she genuinely wanted to hold political office and was devastated when her election bid came for nothing. Uh, either way, Victoria did not win the presidential nomination, and in 1872, in November, she made a miscalculation that nearly cost her everything. In that month, November 1872, her newspaper, The Weekly, ran an article exposing what would become one of the most defining scandals of the decade. In this article, she accused extremely famous Brooklyn preacher Henry Ward Beecher, seen in this image here, as having an affair with, an, with a female married parishioner. Beecher was an influential enemy for Victoria to make. He came from the powerful Beecher family. Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, was his sister. And so Victoria had miscalculated in thinking that she could publicly challenge him. And the fallout from these articles was immediate. Although the issue completely sold out, the powerful men from Beecher's church, as well as women within the suffrage movement who had never liked Victoria, all rallied to discredit her. And they were aided in their attempts to discredit her by a na man named Anthony Comstock, who in 1872 was the commissioner for vice for the YMCA. 
Comstock, from an early age by his own admission, had been fixated on ridding society of what he viewed as obscene material. And he took a very wide definition of that. In his later job as postal inspector, he was able to enforce his beliefs about obscene material. But by the time Victoria published this article, he had already had success getting a law called the Comstock Law on the books nationally, which made it illegal to transport pornographic material over state lines. And between late 1872 and January 1873, he arrested Victoria, Tennessee, and Colonel Blood three times on charges related to that smutty issue of the weekly. This is why Victoria, on election day, was actually in prison and unable to even try to illegally vote for herself. And Comstock went a step farther from just arresting them. He actually also ordered issues of the newspaper across state lines under false names so that he could then arrest them for transporting pornographic material, which again was illegal under the Comstock law. Victoria, Tennessee, and Colonel Blood were ultimately found not guilty in all three trials that resulted. Victoria attempted to rehabilitate her reputation by going on a speaking tour defending traditional marriage, which is something that she had never done. But it was too late, and she was unsuccessful making money at this venture. She was financially exhausted. She was sick from being in prison and from being put on repeated trial, and her reputation was destroyed in America. Given all of this, Victoria and Tennessee made the difficult decision in 1877 to sail for England. They would never return to America. England, though, was kinder to Victoria. Her reputation preceded her, but made her more of a social butterfly than a social pariah, and she became a sought-after public speaker once again. It was at one of her speaking engagements that a man named John Martin saw her and immediately fell in love. Martin's family was wealthy and respectable. It took him six years to convince them that Victoria was respectable too, but they were ultimately successful and were able to get married in 1883. But Victoria had not had her fill of American politics yet. In 1892, probably mostly just to convince everyone in England that she truly had been a part of the women's rights movement, she, from England, declared her candidacy for the U.S. presidential seat again. Now, as we all know, she did not have success winning the presidency that time either, and the fact that she was doing so remotely from England makes an argument that this wasn't a serious bid even more compelling than that argument back in 1872. And her sister Tennessee was also successful in England. In 1884, she married an enormously wealthy widower named Frances Cook and became Lady Cook. She lived in the numerous mansions left to her by her husband after his death in 1901 until her death in 1923. As far as Victoria, she was 59 when her husband died and left her a manor house in the English countryside. And after all of the scandal and all of the challenges of her life, Victoria Woodhull ultimately died a beloved, wealthy English matron in 1927. She lived long enough to see women in England and America get the right to vote. For more activities and online programming, please visit our website at ohiohistory.org learnathome. Thank you for joining us today.